The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Eighteen months ago, during the Living His Love segment, I talked about meditating on the shepherd's psalm, and we prayed through the psalm together. This morning, I want to dig a bit deeper. But first, I want to thank Pastor Dan for stepping in last week, and to those who prayed for me and messaged me, especially Peter Reed, who is a quiet, unassuming and kind friend. Let's pray. Dear God, please send your Holy Spirit into our midst, bless us, and help us become closer to you. Amen. Usually we read the shepherd's psalm as one of thankfulness with a sweet promise. The last line, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, is often read at funerals as the glorious future we desire upon Jesus' return. The psalm expresses the faith and trust of David in God as his protector, provider and guide. A shepherd is someone who takes care of sheep, leading them to find food and water, protecting them from predators and dangers, and restoring them when they are lost or injured. Sheep are dependent on the shepherd for their survival and well-being. Sheep follow their shepherd's voice and obey his commands. I recall Jamie telling us a story a few years ago about how Mandy once hand-reared a lamb, and that years later the adult sheep still recognised her voice. The image of God as a shepherd is a powerful one. A shepherd is someone who knows his sheep intimately, who cares for them and protects them from harm. In the same way, God knows his people intimately and cares for them deeply. He is always watching over them, guiding them and protecting them from harm. Because of this imagery, we usually read this psalm as a message of thankfulness or praise that God is our shepherd. This morning, however, I want to look at the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, as a declaration of intent. Viewed this way, by saying the Lord is my shepherd, David is declaring his allegiance to God. He is declaring that he has chosen God as his shepherd. He chooses not to go his own self-shepherding way, He chooses not to have Satan or this world as his shepherd. What is more, by adding, I shall not want, David is declaring that in choosing the Lord as his shepherd, he will not have cause to want anything that God does not provide. He already knows he won't want anything the shepherd does not give. Read this way, in our minds, we don't have to soften the word want to need because by saying, I will not want, He is declaring that nothing the world has to offer is desirable. He is declaring his certainty that God is going to give him everything he could possibly want. It is this intent expressed in Psalms 23 that I want to look at. Verse 2, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. What do you imagine David was thinking when he wrote that? This scene, or maybe this one, or what about this one? Which one do you think most accurately reflects what he meant? The lush green field we've been brought up to imagine will influence our theology. Does I shall not want look like, look like this picture? The role of getting everything we want is the lush green field theology. In this theology, the role of the shepherd is to get his sheep where they can be comfortable, get fat, and be merry. 
The sheep are contentedly doing what they want to do in the beautiful pasture, and the shepherd is sitting, strumming his harp, looking thoughtful. Do you think this accurately reflects what David was thinking? What about these pictures? Or this one? Maybe this one. This is the actual context of what David was writing about. This was his experience. This is where shepherds hung out. David's reality changes our theology. What is your role as a sheep and what is the shepherd's role in this kind of landscape? The real image David had in mind elevates what the shepherd is doing. Even these images show really, really green pasture compared to where shepherds normally take their sheep. In David's reality, even the green pastures are rough. The terrain is hazardous. Dangerous animals that can hurt the sheep abound. Left alone, the sheep are going to die. In this context, your role as a sheep is to actively follow the shepherd. If you stay still, you are going to be killed by the environment. In David's theology, the role of the shepherd is protective leadership. How crucial in this landscape is this role? It is to protect and to be mindful of what can be eaten. It is continually moving the sheep, being aware of the terrain and always scanning the horizon for danger. You may wonder, could these fields back in David's time have been greener than these modern pictures? No. There has never been enough rain to wash away the top dusty Sinonian rock layer to expose the underlying better quality of soil. Furthermore, archaeologists have been able to trace the pollen deposited in rocks to determine what was growing here in David's time. They have found that the type of vegetation has remained stable for a long time in this region. Early rains and later rains have stayed constant for several thousand years. David's reality was not lush green fields theology. David's reality was of the sheep adoring the shepherd and committing themselves to the shepherd's care. Only survive in relationship where the shepherd protects and the sheep follows. He restores my soul. Four words is all it takes for David to sum up the plan of salvation. In the beginning, we were made in the image of God. Genesis 1 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. To David, the shepherd is restoring his soul, making it into a perfect soul he was created to be, sanctifying him. This isn't making... This isn't about making us feel better. He restores my soul is about making us back into his image. There is no fuzzy good feeling here. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David goes on to tell us how and why and what it means to have your soul undergoing restoration. He tells us the shepherd Jesus leads us in paths of righteousness. He gives us the tough news about how we are led in paths of righteousness, but mixed in with the bad news, he reminds us the shepherd is by our side. The master shepherd does not prevent the valley, but he does walk through it with us. He uses his rod and his staff on us. Sometimes we need a good whack with the rod and sometimes he needs to draw us back from danger with his staff. It defies human logic, but somehow through our trials and tribulations, God restores our soul. Isaiah 48.10, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Sometimes the valley is not to teach us something as an individual. 
Sometimes the valley is not about refining. Sometimes the valley is to bring him honour. For example, in our midst, we have someone who was born with club feet and without cartilage in her hip joints. She has had the ensuing complications and the associated pain and suffering all her life. From the age of 11 months, doctors put Maria in plaster for four whole years. Her 60 plus year, val her 60 plus year valley can't be because of needing to be refined for so long. Maria's valley is to bring him glory. The universe looks on in amazement. Her payout is going to be dancing with the Lord while the universe praises God. John 9, 2 and 3. And his disciple asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God shall be revealed in him. The angels see Maria and marvel. How can God's way be so much better than the devil's? How can she love God in spite of the evil? How can she smile and praise God while carrying this burden that her saviour has given her to carry? Maria's guardian angel is a rock star in heaven. 1 Peter 1.7 That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Thinking about the valley and the way suffering can somehow bring God glory, David continues his psalm. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. To David, God is a Bedouin God. In shepherding territory, life is based on nomadic rules. Shepherds would move through the landscape following the watering holes. The rule of hospitality in the wilderness country, in a barren landscape towards a stranger passing through, is that the head of the house will go out and invite them into the tent. Recall Abraham and the strangers he entertained? The stranger now falls under the protection of the head of the house. The people in the clan will protect the stranger from the dangers in the land. Here, David is declaring that God is the ultimate Bedouin chief. He is saying of God, you prepare a table as head of the household. You are the ultimate provider and protector. You invite me to come under your wings. David is reminding us that God will anoint our head and keep our cup overflowing. David claims goodness and mercy of the Bedouin. He uses the Hebrew word hesed, which describes God's fierce covenantal loyalty. His mercy his faithfulness, his sympathetic love. Hesed is not just a feeling, but an action. It intervenes on behalf of loved ones and comes to their rescue. Hesed is faithful, it is loyal. Hesed is love put into action. Hesed is the most fundamental characteristics of God. Love, covenantal faithfulness, mercy, grace, kindness, loyalty, acts of devotion that go far beyond the requirements of duty. And here is how I want you to understand the very end of this psalm. It is not just about being with God in heaven and the new earth. After reminding him and us of God's Hesed covenant loyalty, David continues his psalm with personal intent, translated literally, forever unto perpetuity of Yahweh in the house I will dwell. David has chosen now, in this lifetime, to dwell in the house of the Lord to the end of his days. As I said, this is a psalm of intent. David has chosen to actively follow the shepherd. He knows the shepherd will allow things that aren't always pleasant, but he knows the shepherd will protect him. David declares the Lord is his shepherd, that he does not and will not want anything other than what the shepherd provides. He declares that he will always follow the shepherd in the hope and knowledge that in some way he may be able to bring his God glory. How then does this psalm apply to you and me in the 21st century? Look carefully then 
how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. We know David's priorities. What are your life priorities? Is God a priority in your life? Is following the shepherd your highest priority? The reason I ask this is because a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to our prayer ministries leader about the worldwide church's 10 days of prayer that ends today. I kid you not, she said to me, we can't do prayer meeting at church during the week. No one would come. She told me it's because we all live too far apart. Apparently, we have tried prayer meeting several times and failed. I know that the path is different for everyone. Prayer meeting is just one way to follow the shepherd. But think carefully about your life life and priorities and our corporate life and priorities. Does our inability to run a midweek meeting indicate we are sheep on the lush green hill from the earlier slide? Are we wandering about eating grass while we imagine the shepherd is sitting nearby, gazing at the scenery? Do we have enough oil for when the bridegroom comes. I wonder why a sizable church like Juan Turner can't get people to a midweek prayer meeting. I know why I haven't been in the past. The reason I haven't been to prayer meeting is because I'm scared someone is going to ask me to pray. Or worse, that everyone is going to pray around in a circle and then it will be my turn. It's not that I don't do plenty of praying, but for me, unprepared public prayer is scary. And it's not just that I can barely string two off-the-cuff sentences together. I struggle to remember people's names. It is really hard to pray for someone if you can't remember their name. So yeah, I fully get people not wanting to come out of fear. I also remember when we had young children, how difficult it was to get everything done at night and the kids off to sleep At best, only one of a couple can attend church meetings during the week. And I know we really do have members that live a long way from church. Pakenham, Yarra Glen, Geelong, Heathcote, Canberra. Coming to church at 7.30 on Wednesday night is not an option for many of us. So I know logistically we couldn't get 50 or even 20, but could we get 5 to 10 people coming every Wednesday night? Satan called a worldwide meeting. The huge crowd hushed as he stepped up to speak. We can't keep the Christians from going to church. We can't keep them from reading their Bibles and knowing the truth. We can't keep them from their conservative values. But we can do something else. He paused. Everyone listened. We can keep them from forming an intimate, abiding experience in Christ. If they gain that connection with Jesus, our power over them is broken. So let them go to church so that they can gain their experience in Jesus Christ. This is what I want you to do. Distract them from gaining hold of their saviour and maintaining a vital connection through the day. How shall we do this? shouted his angels. Simple. Keep them busy, busy, busy in the non-essentials of life. Invent unnumbered schemes to occupy their minds, he answered. Tempt them to spend and spend and borrow and borrow. Keep them from their children. Convince the wives to go out to work uh, and the husband to work six and seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours, so they can afford their lifestyles. Tell them they are doing it for their kids. Ha, that one works well. As their families fragment, soon their homes won't offer an escape from the pressures of work. Overstimulate their minds so they cannot hear the still small voice. Entice them to play the radio whenever they drive. And to keep the TV, streaming services, smartphones, social media and text messages going constantly in their homes. And whenever they have a moment of rest, this will jam their minds and break that union with the enemy. Fill their homes with magazines and newspapers. Pound their minds with the news 24 hours a day, invade their driving moments with billboards, flood their mailboxes with junk mail, sweepstakes, mail order catalogues, newsletters, promotional offerings, free products, services and false hopes. 
even in their recreation. Let them be excessive. Have them return from recreation exhausted, disquieted, and unprepared for the coming week. Don't let them go out in nature. Send them to amusement parks, sporting events, concerts and movies instead. When they meet for spiritual fellowship, involve them in gossip and small talk so that they leave with troubled consciences and unsettled emotions. Don't let them encourage or uplift each other. Keep those who are gifted encouragers especially busy and worn out. And above all, when they get together, keep them from praying for one another. From, from praying for one another. Let them be involved in soul winning, but crowd their lives with so many good causes that they have no time to seek power from Christ. Soon they will be working in their own strength, sacrificing their health and family unity for the good of the cause. It was quite a convention in the end. And the evil angels went eagerly to their assignments, trying to cause Christians everywhere to get busy, busy, busy and rush here and there. Whether we like it or not, the fact is our lives are packed to the brim with so many things we want to pursue in a society that is madly driven by consumerism and marketing we are easily lured into believing that the more we have, the happier we are. Because of the tempting advertisements all around us, we wrongly desire to have it all. Sometimes we extend this thinking even to our work for God. We want to serve God, but at the same time, we don't want to miss out on anything else that crosses our path. We desperately try to harmonise our desire to serve God with the endless pursuit of more and more things. In a restless hurry, we fool ourselves into believing that we can follow God without letting go of everything else that vies for our attention. When we apply this false thinking to our walk with God, we are deceived. Is more truly more? We cannot have it all. We cannot embrace both the world and its luring pleasures and the blessings of God. To think so is a fatal mistake. The mentality of consumerism infects our thinking and inflicts disastrous effects on our spiritual lives. We cannot have God on top of everything else, like icing on the cake, without purposefully making room for him in the crowdedness of our hectic lives. We first must be willing to live with less to experience the blessings of things that matter more. We must let go of the things that distract us from God's presence and, delete and deplete our physical, mental and spiritual energies. Is the clutter in your life holding you back from fully living for God? Crowded lives leave little room for the creator of the universe. We must understand that less is more. We cannot experience more spiritual blessing, more prayer time, more of anything in our spiritual life if we only try to add it to an already full plate. Instead, we must make an intentional decision to live purposefully with less so that we can enjoy more of what matters to God. Less is more. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. To start wrapping up, I want to include a story that came across my desk while I was thinking about this sermon. So that I don't do a Yoshi, I'm going to get Natasha to read it for me. About 20 years ago, I did something that I said all my life I would never do. I moved to Southern California. Since I was raised as a country girl in the Ozarks of Arkansas, living in a highly populated area was never my idea of fun. Far from it. And Southern California was one of those places I had said I would never live. Well, as I've learned over the years, it's best never to say never. I moved to Southern California for a few months because the pay was good and I wanted to get more experience as a travel nurse before I got involved in missions. Little did I know that my months in California would turn into four years, and those four years would give me clarity to God's mission for my life. After working six months at a hospital in San Diego, I moved to Loma Linda. 
In Loma Linda, the opportunities for ministry were endless. The opportunities to grow my social life were also endless, and my home, which I shared with several roommates, became a hub for many young adult activities, parties, and ministry functions. However, while work and ministry and my active social life kept me very busy, my heart was still hungry. I knew that I needed more, more of Jesus. And so I started praying, really praying for more. Show me how to know you, Jesus, I began to pray. Show me how to follow you. Show me how to love you and to comprehend your love for me. As I spent time with Jesus each day, often with my Bible open on my lap and with tears dripping down my cheeks, my hunger grew. Do you really know me by name? I asked Jesus one day. Do you have a unique and specific purpose for me, maybe even beyond working as a nurse? It might seem strange that I would ask Jesus such questions, but as a young adult still seeking to find my place in life and ministry, I really wanted to know that he saw me and that he knew me personally by name. I also wanted to know that I was living in the centre of his will and following his plans for my life. God has a unique way of answering our prayers, and I had no idea how he was about to answer mine. As the winter holiday season was approaching, my roommates and I began talking about what kind of New Year's party we would host. I'd lived on the West Coast for close to two years by this time, and we knew everyone was expecting a great party. However, the closer we got to New Year, the more I felt in my heart that instead of a normal New Year's Eve party, we should host an all-night prayer meeting to welcome in the New Year. It was a unique idea, and I didn't know what everyone would think. But thankfully, my roommates eagerly jumped on board, and to our mutual delight, when New Year's Eve arrived, many of our friends decided to join us too. Some even brought other friends with them. One of those brought a sweet Indian girl of another faith. Her name was Anika. Anika and I were not officially introduced in the beginning, as I was busily busting around tending to the last-minute details for our all-night prayer meeting. However, about 30 minutes into the evening, someone spoke my name, and Annika looked up in surprise. As I got up to go into the kitchen to get something, she also got up and followed me, pulling me aside. Is your name Melody? Is this your home? She asked. Yes. Why? I replied. With tears in her eyes, she said how she had she been praying that very day about what to do for New Year's Eve. She didn't want to attend the usual wild young adult parties, yet she didn't know where to go. However, as she was reading her Bible, God impressed upon her mind that she needed to go to Melody's home. But God, she argued, I don't know a Melody. Later, the conviction came back stronger. Tonight, you need to go to Melody's home for prayer. If you show me who Melody is, I will gladly go, she told God. However, she didn't know anyone Melody named Melody, so again, she brushed the thoughts aside. Not long after, her friends, who was friends with one of Melody's roommates, invited her to attend our all-night prayer meeting. The friend did not mention my name, just that she... Sorry. She did not mention my name, but Annika excitedly accepted the invite. The impression that she had received earlier in the day about Melody's home was temporarily forgotten... Forgotten, that is, until she heard someone refer to me by name. God told me to come here, she told me incredulously. He told me your name before I met you. He even told me to come to your home and to pray. It was my turn to be incredulous. He, he told you my name, I asked, as tears came to my own eyes. Yes. I couldn't believe it. Here I'd been praying, asking God if he knew my name, and through a sweet Indian girl of faith, he had answered my prayer. If, as Melody said, he's written your name and my name on the palm of his hands with nail print scars, can we not trust he cares about what's going on in our life right now, today? He cares about the messy stuff, about the confusing stuff, and about the things that don't make sense. Originally, my sermon was going to be a nice one about Psalms 23, 
with a call to be purposeful about your relationship with God. But over many restless nights, it has morphed into a Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 sermon. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more, as you see the day approaching. And so I'm stirring up and exhorting, not from a position of having it all together, but as a fellow traveller struggling with time and priorities and life, the same as everyone else. This year, Pastor Dan has been giving us the same message, reminding us that we need to take on board the lessons of the ten virgins. We need oil, and we need a third place. Therefore, in closing, the dream that I've been told is impossible. A third place, a place where everyone knows your name. If you feel impressed to find out if God knows your name, to deepen your relationship with God, or to start praying earnestly for revival, and are prepared to give up something that is less important to, to come here for Bible study on Wednesday nights, send me an email, talk to Simone, Paul, or Pastor Dan. Five people meeting here every week at church. If you want to come but you can't because of your children, let us know, we will try to work something out. Matthew 18.20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Think about it. God in our midst on Wednesday nights. I know you're too busy. I am too. But let us put aside the busyness, the things that distract us from our highest priority. We need to spend quantity time with the shepherd. I've been given tacit approval by the pastor to start a midweek life group. It is usually called prayer meeting, but that has connotations of people praying for long periods. Something you may consider is boring, pretentious, or for you like me, impossible to do. Instead, we will call it midweek, midweek seeker life group. Do not fear. You will be welcome to pray, but I won't ask you in front of everyone. You will be welcome to read the Bible out loud, but I won't ask that either. I want to create a safe place that brings us closer to God, a place where we can spend shared time with God. This is a personal appeal to you as an individual. Don't leave it to someone else because they may be leaving it to you. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Even though this is way outside my comfort zone, Please send me an email or a text message if you can come. Ellen White knew how good Christians get too busy. She says in education, an intensity such as never before was seen is taking possession of the world in amusement, in money-making, in the contest for power, in the very struggle for existence. There is a terrible force that engrosses body and mind and soul. In the midst of this maddening rush, God is speaking. He bids us come apart and commune with him. Be still and know that I am God. Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. They are in too great haste. With hurried steps, they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. They have no time to remain with the divine teacher. With their burdens, they return to their work. These workers can never attain the highest success until they learn the secret of strength. They must give themselves time to think, to pray, to wait upon God for a renewal of physical, mental and spiritual power. They need the uplifting influence of his spirit Receiving this, they will be quickened by fresh life. The wearied frame and tired brain will be refreshed. The burdened heart will be lightened. Not a pause for a moment in his presence, but personal contact with Christ to sit down in, in companionship with him. This is our need. 
As we talked about earlier, our shepherd is anxious to look after us in a covenantal relationship. All we have to do is want to be looked after. He guides us in paths of righteousness. He walks beside us in the trials and tribulations that he chooses will refine us into pure gold. Our God guarantees us food and water and protection while our enemy rages. He will give us oil for our lamps, spare oil. Let us make David's prayer our right now commitment, our desire to be in his, in his house of prayer. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. When I was a little boy, adventurer's age, I used to sing a song to myself as I went to sleep. But don't panic. I don't have Pastor Wendy's voice, so I'm not going to sing it. The words are simple and repetitive. I'm sure most of you know the song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The second verse, though none go with me, I, I still will follow. The third verse, the world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. I'd love for you to come on Wednesday nights, but whether you can come to a midweek Bible study or not, decide today, even if no one else joins you, to relentlessly follow Jesus, your shepherd, and to dwell in the house of the Lord. No turning back.